You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. With more than 30 weekly podcasts, HRN has something for every food lover. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is presented by Forever Cheese. Learn more at forevercheese.com. So you started in TV, which is the good old-fashioned media, and then quickly progressed to digital. And you and I had a, a great conversation last week leading up to the show, and you started a social media and digital marketing company when you were in high school. Is that sort of like the new paper route or the new after school job? Is that something that was really natural to you and instinctual because you are really the first digital generation where you're not learning it. It's just simply a part of your world. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for me, um, you know, the digital landscape and uh, social media, broader speaking, is definitely something that's, you know, kind of second nature and really just intuitive, I guess, because I grew up with it. So for me, it was definitely, I think, easier than if someone who hadn't grown up with it to, you know, like adopt these all these platforms, be able to figure them out. And I, I definitely think that that really helped me out a lot. You just heard Jennifer Liuzzi of HRN's Tech Bytes speaking with Aton Bernaff, who's a chef, author, and social media content creator. You may have heard it said, or even uttered the phrase yourself, that the eyes eat first. This is especially true of the social media world, and this week on Meet and 3, we are examining the intersection of the digital world with food. We spoke with people across the landscape of food media, from talent agencies to blogs to magazines, to understand a bit more about how we, collectively, are all in real time experiencing changes in the food media industry. I'm Matt Patterson, and this is Meet and 3 on HRN. Meet and 3. Meet and 3. Meet and 3. One meat, three sides. Food, news, and storytelling. A square meal for your ears. Meat and three. For our first story, we're picking back up with Jennifer and Aton's conversation about how platforms like TikTok have changed who we learn to cook from. Maybe you know him from TikTok. Maybe you're one of his 2.2 million followers. Maybe you first saw him on Chopped when he was 11 years old. He just turned 20. And in the past 10 years, he has been cooking online, cooking on TV. So this is the perfect opportunity, I think, for us to find out what do you have to do to get 2 million followers on TikTok? What are the secrets to becoming a global sensation on social media? Yes, I... I'm really grateful for this job, but I think that a interesting part of this job is I feel like, you know, it's slowly becoming more respected in the general population, but I think people still really just think it's like someone just randomly filming videos on their phone and like mindlessly filming and uploading and not really putting much thought into it. You know, it's, it's a calculated uh, industry, you know. Well, I, uh, I, I think that's because people have phones, you know, people don't have a TV studio, So watching a TV show seems like something different. But I have a phone and I can go out and I can shoot a video or I can FaceTime somebody. I can start a TikTok account and do that also. So it's an interesting, I mean, similar to cooking, it's so democratically accessible to just about everybody that people are doing many of the same like physical activities that you're doing. They're just maybe not articulating it in the same way and certainly people are not watching it in the same way. What do you think makes that difference? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the greatest parts of digital platforms and of social media has been the democratization of entertainment and of, you know, what it is to be, quote unquote, celebrity or famous. And, you know, I think that one of the greatest parts of that is that it's opened up so many more voices. You know, 10 years ago, if you wanted to learn about food, there were there were a lot of pe- most of the people in food media, you know, look very, look very similar, come from very similar backgrounds, very similar training. 
And there were all these inc- many, 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 many incredible cuisines and cultures and, and foods and stories and perspectives that, you know, were just never, never put in the spotlight. And I think one of the greatest parts of social media is that it really democratizes that, you know, there's not some big executive choosing who will get to be viewed by millions of people. There's just algorithms that just, you know, see what people like. And if people are responding well to content, show it to more people. And I think that that's one of the really the greatest parts is that, you know, it it is democratized and it is accessible, you know, from a physical standpoint, um, you know, almost anyone can film a cookie video on their phone. I mean, I think, you know, obviously what makes a difference is a lot of the analytical parts. You know, if you look at the range of voices now that are big in food media, um, it looks it looks quite different. And I think that's that's a really great thing. And I think it's obviously great for equity and, you know, people having equal opportunity. Uh, but I mean, also just for the end consumer. I mean, you you now as a consumer have just a vast, vast uh, array of of content and food knowledge you can learn because there's now just a wider array of, of voices out there. With smartphones, all the tools to create and curate food content are now at our fingertips. There's no longer a singular voice dictating trends and recipes. Instead, social media has thrown open the doors to anyone and everyone willing to contribute. In our next story, Sasha Dubose talks with Shanika Hillix, a brand strategy and marketing consultant, about emerging voices in food media. As a food influencer and writer myself, I am enamored with food media. My love affair with food blogging started in 2021 when I gave my food photos a home of their own. Food Instagram pages like mine started popping up left and right, filled with fresh faces and pretty plates. With the abundance of new voices talking about food, celebrity chefs no longer drive food media forward. Shanika Hillux, the head of talent at Hone, a culinary talent agency, witnessed the rise of the celebrity chef, making her realize whose stories are prioritized in traditional food media. And while I was observing that, I also was kind of doing a reflection and telling myself, you know, I actually know several other names and faces who look like me, you know, Black people, wondering like where they are in these conversations and what's going down and also feeling just a bit bored (laughs) with the overall run-of-the-mill story that headlined some of the larger outlets and publications. And so while I was still a publicist, I started writing myself. Food storytelling takes time and food blogging is more than curated photos and captions. As technology advances and trend cycles speed up, it's hard not to get bogged down by the pressure to constantly post. Shanika suggests taking a step away from follower counts, focusing on the personal elements of content creation. I know that we are in a world of instant gratification with delivery and getting things under an hour and all of that jazz, but I also believe in humanity and understanding that in order to story tell truthfully that time is something that is part of that key ingredient or that recipe you know so yeah it's hard when then you have something that's spewing out insights 24 hours after you've posted something and you can see those tangible pieces of data and information leaning into the human touch that content creation requires opens up new ways influencers can engage with their followers and each other I'm always just thinking about like, what are my human KPIs outside of like reach and impression and awareness? It's like, actually, I felt really good putting this out in the world, or this is something that I finally mastered in a creative form, or I was able to gather people together to share a message or have a conversation laddering up to a larger goal that might not even be seen by a mass audience. In some ways, a lot of us are content creators. I take restaurant recommendations from my followers and choose recipes based on what my friends send me. From my latest home-cooked meal to a dinner with friends, I'm constantly sharing my life and what I eat with everyone. The word influencer, if we can even stretch that, like I believe if you're a user on this platform, you do have sphere of influence. Truly, we are all entities of information in our own right. You know, we hop on, say things, make recommendations, 
speak on something that happened to us and then want to like share it out in the world, right? And so because we are now broadcasting our own talents and lives and areas of expertise and work, we are all, in fact, sources of information. Media is, in fact, that information. The variety of voices in food media today means information about food is becoming a communal resource. The celebrity chef no longer gatekeeps their best-kept secrets, meaning we all have access to a world of food knowledge. Hone is at the forefront of this change, showcasing talent from all sectors of the food industry. I just love that it feels very collective. Um, You know, we talk about competing outlets all the time and exclusives and who's going to get it first and who's going to break the story. And for me, I feel like the only way that we can address some of the concerns that I even mentioned is like with collective power and voice and perspective and talent. With celebrity chefs no longer at the helm of food media, Hone is embracing the fact that there is no sole authority figure when it comes to food. We're not the only experts. We aren't the only ones who know and have final say. There are various perspectives and voices from across the U.S., across borders even, and we're inviting those voices to be part of a larger conversation. Hone aims to bridge the gap between virtual and real-life communities. The agency hosts town halls once a month so influencers can connect with each other and share opportunities. As head of talent, Shanika approaches her role in a way that honors the diverse goals of Hone's roster. We're also giving true uh, thought and time to the process and understanding who these folks are and their larger aspirations for what they would like to do outside of the kitchen or um, behind a camera, a real camera, not an iPhone camera, or within a book, et cetera. So yeah, just holding space and and being thoughtful and strategic about how we can support is, uh, yeah, I think a big point of difference and a value proposition for sure. Food media is honing in on community now more than ever. If food is only as good as the people you share it with, why would food media be any different? Culinary talent is expanding beyond chefs and authors, so we all have the opportunity to share how food impacts the most delicious parts of our lives. We'll be right back with more Meat and 3 after a brief break. Forever Cheese, a leading importer of cheese and specialty food, has sourced exceptional products from Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Croatia for 25 years. Offering a wide selection of artisan cheese, charcuterie, nuts, crackers, preserves, and more, their products are sold in stores nationwide. Forever Cheese seeks out the best of the Mediterranean and focuses on sharing stories from their family of producers. Each product has a unique story, and their goal is to celebrate each one. From Drunken Goat to Genuine Fluvi Pecorino Romano, Mostarda to Mitica Marcona Almonds, and Duya to Hamon Iberico, Forever Cheese is proud to offer products they love from people they believe in. Their passion, quality, and range are unmatched. Learn more at forevercheese.com and look for their products in a grocery store, restaurant, or specialty food shop near you. Welcome back to Meet N3. Next, Katie Ruther chats with food writer Kathy Irway about embracing nuances in cultural and personal identities. Thankfully, you know, there's been a broadening of content, a more more acceptance of what used to be pushed back upon me as too niche. This is freelance food writer Kathy Irway. Kathy began her food writing career in 2006 with a blog called Not Eating Out in New York. After releasing a memoir inspired by the blog, she dreamt of publishing a Taiwanese cookbook for an English-speaking audience. Considered too niche, it took years for Kathy to find someone willing to take a chance on her book. Nowadays, she covers a wide array of topics related to Taiwanese and Chinese food in America. From fermented tofu to the ways Asian American chefs and farmers are integrating their mixed identities into the foods they produce. The rise of these stories reflects wider shifts in the Asian American and Pacific Islander food media landscape. Kathy turns to the stinky lunchbox story to illustrate. The idea of going to your elementary school cafeteria or whatever and opening your lunch 
And then everyone sort of ewing it and, you know, saying that smells bad because it's something that your Asian mom made. <laughs> and um, I can really, like, I remember, like, my mom sometimes made um, sandwiches with rosung, which is, like, shredded pork floss <laughs> in between, like, pieces of white bread. I don't think it smelled much, but it was definitely, like, you know, a little strange for some of the kids who saw it. This shared experience has been embraced by the AAPI community. What was once a source of shame is now something that brings people together. I've seen like an Instagram handle, like the Stinky Lunchbox Collective. I just love that, you know, Stinky Lunchbox story can be a cliche nowadays in food media, right? Isn't that quite a sign of progress, if you will? <laughs> like it, from going from, you know, not really talking about these foods these topics to having them become a cliche thing to write about. Though Kathy acknowledges their limitations, she also recognizes the importance of these stories. It just goes to show that so many people have these stories that really, that they felt, um, you know, really impacted them. And oftentimes the, the sort of narrative arc is that they came around and sort of reclaimed and really like owned this food and loved this food. And uh, which is the story of so, you know, growing up in America um, for so many Asian Americans. Beyond reclamation, many Asian American food creators are going further to embrace their multifaceted influences. One thing that I think has been really interesting in the last few years with regards to Asian American food media is that I've been seeing more and more sort of Asian hyphen American. So whether it's Eric Kim's Korean hyphen American uh, cookbook, which is the title of his cookbook, or actually, we, you know, the Winsun is, the Winsun cookbook is called A Taiwanese American Cookbook, um, to, to things like Abby Ballingit's Mayumu Filipino American Desserts. This Asian hyphen American content highlights hybrid cuisines from people's personal experiences. I've been seeing um, creative, personal, and delicious looking takes on the food that different individuals have grown up with and sort of grew up to sort of reinvent because they grew up in America. So it's like taking a little bit from your heritage and taking a little bit from your life experiences, wherever, whichever cities you lived in, wherever you traveled, whatever you just kind of loved eating because that's what you eat in America and just kind of making it their own. And you see that in restaurants too, but I, I've been seeing that a lot in cookbooks and in food media. So I think that's a really cool development and um, I look forward to seeing more of it. Kathy's observations demonstrate how Asian Americans are using food media to break down and build out stories of their nuanced cultural identities. For our final story, Clara Thompson speaks with Kat Craddock editorial director and now owner of the newly independent Savur about her hopes for the future of the magazine. Kat Craddock is a culinary Swiss army knife who turned her love of food into a literary career. She first worked as a cheesemonger, then line cook, and then chef in the Savour test kitchen. Kat soon moved up the ranks to become editorial director, and last month, Kat approached Savour's parent company and purchased it back with an investor, making Savour an independent publication. I talked to Kat about the thought process behind the purchase and her hopes for Savoy. Well, I had kind of lived through another acquisition a few years ago. You know, Recurrent purchased us um, with a few of our old sister brands from um, from Bonnier. So having seen how it worked, it um, it made the idea of purchasing the brand seem a little less remote. Um, it seemed possible and I could either sit back and let somebody else buy it or, or do it myself. The purchase is exciting not only for Kat, but for the whole Savoir team. I mean, it's really exciting, and I've stuck with this brand so long through a lot of different changes because I love it so much. And the the team that came along with me, they're all really exceptional um, in very different ways. And I think that it's been, um, I feel really heartened that they chose to, <laughs> to come along and um, stay working with me on this. And we hired a couple people three people back who um, are Savor veterans as well. So it's nice to kind of put the band back together a little bit um, and really, you know, give, give the team the opportunity to work on a lot of things that they um, 
their hands were a little bit tied on before under like a corporate structure. Kat's purchase of Savor is a full circle moment for her love of the magazine. I started reading Savor when I was a kid. You know, it launched in the 90s and I was like 10 or 11 or so. And, um, you know, I read it all along. And I think that kind of had a lot to do with my continued interest. I'd been in the business for 10 years. I was starting to be a little bit over it and kind of dabbled in food media a little bit as a freelancer. Ended up in the test kitchen because I had a lot of culinary experience and it made a lot of sense to be there. I'd been testing recipes for cookbooks and stuff at the time. Um, And, you know, then editor-in-chief Adam Sachs and test kitchen manager Faraday sat again, um, very kindly let me kind of come in on my two days off from working in a bakery. Two people gave me a chance and I really appreciate that. And Kat is hopeful for a new food media landscape filled with independent voices that uplift a diversity of cuisine and people. I hope moving forward that there continue to be more little indie publications out there and, you know, more independent voices. You know, it's, it's really heartbreaking to see a lot of these big legacy publications fold, of course. Um, and I would love to see them survive or come back. You know, I think it's better for everybody if there are more of us out there than fewer, obviously. But I do think that, you know, it is exciting that um, technology makes it so much easier for people to self-publish in different ways, whether it's, you know, TikTok stream or an independent like zine or whatever. I think that, you know, People want more food media. You know, I don't think that it is necessarily oversaturation. I think that it's a good thing if, you know, everybody can find something that is what they're looking for. That's what I want to see in Sever. That's what I want to see in food media in general, you know, and just uplifting, um, uplifting multiple cuisines and people that we're excited about. That's our show. Thanks for listening. Learn more about the guests and topics we touched on this week by checking out our show notes. Special thanks this week to Charlotte Rhodes, Sasha DuBose, Katie Ruther, Clara Thompson, and Taylor Early. Meet and Three is produced by H. Conley, Taylor Early, and this episode was produced and engineered by me, Matt Patterson. Our theme song was composed by Breakmaster Cylinder. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Meet and 3 is powered by Simplecast. Meet and 3 is a production of Heritage Radio Network, the world's pioneer food radio station. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org and follow us at heritage underscore radio. And please stay in touch. Whether you have a story idea or would just like to say hey, write us at ideas at meetand3.nyc. That's all spelled out.